vocal infections are silent and insidious. You, you rarely feel any symptoms from them, but the disturbed area called the disturbed feel, not local, somewhere else in the body, is chronically causing a problem, and that's why they're so hard to diagnose. But you got your right knee, so when you have a right knee problem or a left hip or whatever, or a, you know, sore neck all the time, that's often not the cause. It's usually deeper than that. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions and Food Farming in the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrada Gore. This is episode 39, and my guest is Dr. Louisa Williams. Louisa is interested in helping people find wellness by getting to the true root of underlying causes of disease. In today's episode, she touches on some lesser-known obstacles to cure, and she gives us ideas on how to find the best dental and overall health care to achieve optimal and vibrant health that is our most important birthright. Before we dive into the conversation, we want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the Weston A. Price Foundation, dedicated to restoring nutrient-dense foods to the diet through education, research, and activism. They are wrapping up their fundraising drive right now, so please consider a gift today. Go to westonaprice.org. And the foundation is holding the Wise Traditions Conference in Montgomery, Alabama, November 11th to the 14th. You really don't want to miss this unique opportunity to learn from health and wellness experts from all over the world. Learn, eat well, and have fun. Go to wisetraditions.org for more information. Welcome to the podcast, Louisa. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we have to start with how radical you are. Why (laughs) is the title of your latest book, Radical Medicine? Yeah, well, radical comes from the Latin root radix, which means root, literally root, and it means the root or cause of something. And if you've been in practice for a long time, you get very discouraged when patients aren't getting well, so you keep looking for the best cures, the the products, the remedies, the treatments that are the most curative, the most effective. And over the years, you just sift out what really works and what doesn't. And often, what really works is the treatment that's getting to the true cause of the issue. So uh, I'm always first, as we all should be, diagnosing the problem. The word diagnosis is Greek. It means uh, dia, which means through, and gnosis is the other root, which is that internal wisdom, you know, that inner knowing when you just know something's right. So a diagnosis, for example, should be something that's so comprehensive and understandable that it explains clearly what steps you should take towards treatment. So, for example, just arthritis, joint pain, is a ridiculous diagnosis. You really need to understand why you have arthritis, arthritis secondary to a gluten allergy or, you know, something like that or what kind of type of arthritis. So, uh, anyway, I wrote the book Radical Medicine years ago uh, because, uh, sadly, I found too many of my holistic colleagues not getting to the root as much as I thought. Too many colleagues handing out thyroid medicines because a person was tired, you know, when really the thyroid is 90% not the cause. Or giving so-called bioidentical hormones because of, uh, you know, menopausal issues. So I really wanted to emphasize in my book and in my philosophy the, the idea of really getting to the true cause of the problem, remove those obstacles to cure, as Samuel Hahnemann coined in homeopathy in the 1700s, and then the patient can naturally get well. Those of us who are looking for natural alternatives um, may find ourselves turning from a conventional doctor to a holistic doctor, and the difference is the holistic doctor is giving us, like, echinacea instead of Advil, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And so you're still treating the symptoms. Yeah. 
perfect example, Hilda, perfect example. And there's a lot of allopathically oriented holistic doctors that they're really not getting to the cause. So in my practice, I, I kept thinking, you know, what is the cause? And, and over the 31 years I've been in practice, I've identified some major causes of illness. I really actually wanted to talk to you about dental focal infections. First of all, what does that mean to have a dental focal infection? And how does that affect our health? Right. So like so many things that have been obscured in traditional medicine and traditional diets, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, focal infections were all the rage. Holistic dentists and doctors knew all about focal infections. And uh, in fact, Benjamin Rush, the father of medicine in our country, who was the um, the uh, doctor to George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, he used to pull rotten teeth and cure arthritis or depression or other illnesses. So there's a long history in the 1700s, 1800s, and early 1900s of recognizing that these chronic, often silent infections in the body, often in the head, sinus, teeth, and tonsils, could cause all kinds of mental physical, emotional issues. Who knew? I think in today's society, we just think, you know, my teeth hurt or I have a problem, I have an infection, go to the dentist and I'm done. But you're saying there is a connection between what's happening in our mouth and what's happening in our bodies. Right. And, and you know, conventional medicine has known this in the Merck's manual. Lots of information about uh, strep infections, tonsillitis, and possibly ensuing rheumatic fever where the bacteria migrate, literally metastasize in the blood to the heart valves. So that's well known. And even in the research studies nowadays, it's well known, for example, that uh, gingivitis and periodontitis, bacteria-laden gum infections, that that bacteria can travel in the body. And they're especially worried about the heart because that can cause uh, you know, rheumatic fever and death you know, at times. So that's been well known for a century, but two things happened in the 20th century. The rise of antibiotics, 1930s, 1940s. So you could give antibiotics. We didn't know about the bad effects back then. You, it's like a miracle. Take care of the infection, then you're fine. Also the rise of endodontics. So root canals became very popular, uh, popular field for dentists, and people started just getting a root canal. In short term, it does take care of a lot of the bacterial overload. So those two things, as well as there was a lot of medical backlash to the focal infection, doctors and dentists. So um, it all got obscured, and thankfully it's coming back. Why do you think, I'm just curious, why do you think there was a medical backlash? There was, it, it is true that there was a, uh, an excessive amount of pulling teeth at times. There was some jealousy among the allopathic doctors because as the rise of medicine and dentistry became more uh, conventional, the old holistic dental physician, for example, was considered to not fit in anymore, like Dr. Weston Price. He had a research lab in his dental office. You know, ah. he, he had rabbits that he studied, you know, uh-huh. and pl- implanted a root canal tooth from a patient who had died from a heart attack in the under the skin of a rabbit, and within two weeks the rabbit would die of a heart attack. Then he'd take that tooth out again, or or some kind of heart disease, uh-huh. and then he'd take that tooth out again. He would autoclave it. He would clean it like crazy with you know toxic substances we could never put in our bodies. He'd he'd put it under another rabbit's skin, and uh, that rabbit would die of some kind of heart disease within a few weeks. And he would do it over and over and over again. And that rabbit would emulate the same disease that the original patient with the tooth had died of. That's so fascinating. They did fantastic research back then, you know, showing that not only is a damaged tooth impossible to sterilize, but also it has a particular selective affinity. This is Dr. Edward Rose now. He was a brilliant uh, scientist. He worked for the Mayo Foundation for 30 years, so he was incredible and a renowned scientist. And he found there was a selective affinity for the particular bacteria in a particular damaged tooth. And some would, you know, some streptococcus bacteria particularly like the warm, moist environment of the heart valves, very cozy place to live, or the synovial fluid, a very nice 
partial oxygen environment where the bacteria could migrate to and survive in our bodies. Our teeth are linked to different parts of our body and the bacteria have an affinity or a connection. Yes. So if something happens to the fourth tooth over, I'm not, I'm not a dentist, so I'm just saying, like my fourth tooth over in the lower part of my jaw, that may affect my thigh and how I walk, right? Exactly. exactly. Interesting. Well, let's get back to the two things you said that affect our health and came to arise in the 1930s, the use of antibiotics and root canals. Root canals yeah. How do these affect us today, or what, what's going on with these two things? Yeah, good question, because people should not be panicking about their root canals. Dr. Price, who was the, ma- uh, the most amazing quintessential holistic physician, right, the, the dental physician of his time and, and still now, said in the 1930s to a Cleveland Dental Society that root canal teeth are always a stress. And that's true. If you look on the internet, you will see that they always generate bacteria. They're a dead tooth. They're always going to be a stress in the body. However, Dr. Price said, not all of these teeth should be pulled. If they're particularly important and valuable to the patient, and if the patient is at a level of a, of a certain level of health, he or she can hold on to those teeth because they need it more than they do to extract it. So nowadays, you know, I tell patients um, we have to take each patient at a time individually. If the patient is in ill health, if the patient has a diagnosis of breast cancer or something serious, then we're not conservative at all. We refer them to a biological dentist where that dentist will do cavitation surgery, meaning you don't just pull the tooth, but you go in and you clean out all the periodontal periodontal ligament, all the bone infection. When you grind that dead bone down, the osteoblast and clean, you know, sew it up, clean it up afterwards, the osteoblast in the remaining bone start functioning again, and within three months you you don't have a socket anymore. It's nicely filled in with clean bone. If you're a conventional dentist and you just pull the tooth, you think you're doing the patient a favor, like let's pull the tooth and get out of there quickly, you're leaving fragments and infection behind. So you're really not doing the patient any good. It's still going to be a chronic focal infection. Oh, that's what you mean by cavitation surgery. Focal infection. If you're going to do it, you want to go to a good biological dentist and do it, do it correctly. And the way you figure it out is you, first of all, just take an inexpensive periapical x-ray, Uh, an an x-ray of the root of the tooth and um, the general rule is if that x-ray is positive it's almost impossible to cure Mm -hmm. if it's not positive you're still not sure if it doesn't have for example a little black hole at the root of the tooth uh, black radiolucency if it's if it looks okay you're still not sure because there has to be like 40 to 60 percent bone destruction before it's visible on x-ray so you're still not 100% sure, but that's, those are the times if the patient is not in a severe crisis for you to be conservative and see if you can figure out what's wrong with that tooth. Perhaps it's a visceral-dental uh, problem, a visceral-odontic problem. Maybe I'm eating sugar every day and it's my pancreas reflexing into my uh, first molar area. And if I just clean up my diet, the tooth will be less inflamed and you can not not lose the tooth. So I think sometimes people pick dentists because they think, oh, this one's friendly and, you know, is good with my children, or, or this one doesn't, you know, clean as rough as the other one I went to. But there's more to it than that. We shouldn't just pick a dentist because they seem nice or their practice is near our house. It seems like we're really going to have to put thought into who sees our teeth because there's much more at play here than some may have realized. Yes, and, and you know, some, some obvious um, red flags are, say you go in and, you know, you need a filling. You have a cavity. Well, you have a filling already. Mm-hmm. And the dentist says, you know, it's kind of a big filling there. I think we need to put a crown on. That's a red flag. A holistic dentist would try to uh, drill as little tooth as possible, tooth material. So you'd go from a filling, for example, to a larger filling, to an inlay, to an onlay, and then a crown if you needed it, which takes about two-thirds of the tooth away. So you only do a crown when you really need to. So that's one red flag. Another red flag if the dentist is still saying, and I love this line because they must have heard this at an ADA conference many years ago, (laughs) the jury's still out. 
Uh, That's their party line. We're still not sure mercury amalgam's a problem, so don't worry about it. There's still a lot of dentists that do that, even though you you know you don't think so. So it's true. I thought just older people had silver fillings, which are mercury fillings. Yeah. But I've met some young people recently who are like, oh yeah, I had one happily. They had it removed. We could have you know a whole discussion about that, but and that also needs to be done with certain protocol and very carefully, right? So this Yes, this very is carefully very by a good dentist because it can harm you. And also it's good to have a holistic doctor or practitioner who is assessing the patient's health. I've had patients that I don't I have them remove their mercury amalgam fillings for a whole year. Mm-hmm. I have to work on their liver function, their kidney function. I might even get them on their homeopathic remedy first before we can even begin that process. You have to be strong enough to handle that. To detoxify effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We want to pause just for a moment now to thank our sponsors the Weston A. Price Foundation. Confused about nutrition? The Weston A. Price Foundation sets the record straight. Find out why butter is a health food, why soy foods are not your friend, and why optimal health is found in the wise food traditions of our ancestors. Go to westonaprice.org for details on all of the above, and please consider giving a gift of any size to support this critical mission. And why don't you join us at the Wise Traditions Conference in Montgomery, Alabama this November. Today's guest will be there, and so will I. It's going to be amazing. You will have opportunities to delve deeper on all sorts of topics ask questions, and connect with people from all around the world who care about food, farming, and the healing arts. There will be 44 expert speakers, 5 delicious meals, 85 great exhibitors, and over 1,000 attendees. Learn, eat well, and have fun. Go to wisetraditions.org for details. Okay, so root canals, we don't have to be afraid of, you said. Um, what would you do again? You would make sure you have a proper dentist to right. know how to... Well, you want to assess the patient first. So if the root canal, for example, is positive on x-ray, uh-huh. if it's causing ipsilateral symptoms, and this is a good thing for people to remember, teeth and, and focal infections tend to cause ipsilateral same-sided symptoms. So if I have a right-sided tooth that is bothering me, it's a problematic on x-ray or suspicious, and I have right shoulder pain or right hip pain, and I've done everything I can, then it's time to consider cleaning up that tooth or extracting that tooth or whatever is necessary to heal that tooth to figure out if the tooth's the problem. The trouble is you go to a conventional doctor and even a lot of my colleagues, and they'll just give them, you know, like you said, you know, turmeric or something for the hip pain or, uh, you know, do this or do that, you know, exercise for the hip pain. And, you know, you really, even, you know, as a holistic doctor especially, you've got to open the mouth and look at those teeth. One really easy thing to fix is dental galvanism. Say you have a mercury filling next to a gold crown or a gold crown on top of a mercury filling, that creates a galvanic current, and that also is what's called a galvanic focus. So it can cause right cr- chronic right shoulder pain, right neck pain, you know, that kind of thing. All you need to do is get that gold out of there because uh, Swedish research showed that gold is very allergenic sadly and surprisingly because a lot of people thought that the gold material was the best um, so you want to get the mercury and the gold out and uh, and then you know the shoulder should uh, subside the shoulder pain should should subside and you haven't lost any teeth you've just gotten rid of the toxic materials yeah I've heard that if the gold what you're saying is that the gold is touching the mercury it causes it to course through the body in a stronger fashion stronger fashion exactly oh. it's a battery it's like a battery Oh, positive scary. and negative currents. Another red flag is PFM. Just wanted to say that porcelain fused to metal. Bring this up. Uh, a lot of conventional dentists will say, "Yeah, we'll give you a porcelain crown," and you're like, "Great!" And you get the crown. It's all white. Looks okay. Porcelain seems pretty inert. You look underneath at the gum line, and there's a metal sleeve or shoulder underneath that porcelain. And that metal sleeve can be stainless steel. And what did they put in stainless steel after World War II to make it stronger? Nickel. Nickel is allergenic to 20% of women, 10% of men, and frankly carcinogenic. Clearly, clearly understood in the research literature. So don't let your conventional dentist tell you, oh, we're going to do a porcelain crown. Ask him, does that have metal in it, you know, underneath it? And And try not to get that if you can. 
I have a good dental materials list on my website, radicalmedicine.com. That's a general list of reasonably inert materials to, to use as a guideline with your dentist. Won't the dentist be surprised if we come into their office with a list of things that we want to avoid? But we need to be our own advocates in this, don't we? We need to be assertive because you pay, you know, what, $1,800 or something for a crown, and then you find out that it's not the right material and you have to go through that drilling and money again. So you really need to do your homework and be assertive. I have a, I have a book, two, book, two e-books on my radical medicine site, one called The Five uh, Dental Cavitation Surgery Days to help you if you do have to get a uh, uh, surgery and remove a tooth and then another one called uh, the five um, uh, detox days for getting mercury amalgam removed kind of hung up on the number five as you can tell. <laughs> but it seems to be the major acute days of stress after a dental visit that you need to hit fire with fire that you need to treat acutely strongly detox and strongly handle you know the surgery after effects so interesting um, I have a little anecdote. I had um, some mercury fillings replaced, and a few days after, I was vomiting. And I contacted the office and said, is this related? And they were like, oh, no, we followed the protocol. But intuitively, I had the feeling that something, I may have been exposed, even however so slightly, yeah. to some mercury vapor. So that's yeah. very important. That these ebooks sound fascinating and helpful. Yeah, if you prepare, I have wonderful success nowadays. I prepare the patient before, afterwards. They do everything right, really. I mean, you know, a well-prepared patient and a proper detox and healing afterwards you can you can do beautifully through these dental visits fantastic now tell us about antibiotics what's the problem with that yeah i coined a a uh, term caspers a few years ago and that's another ebook on my radical medicine site and what it is is chronic autoimmune stealth pathogens evolve from resistant bacterial species and basically what that means is is that when we take antibiotics just like in the hospital when patients are giving antibiotics and they get resistant bacteria and can die from that we all know about that like MRSA yeah like say MRSA C. And, diff yeah exactly exactly so that can happen at home too that's just not confined to the hospital so when we take round after round of antibiotics what happens is we develop what's called cell wall deficient bacteria meaning the bacteria normally has a cell wall but in its wisdom it uh, will lose its cell wall look a little more like a virus get smaller and hide in the body so subsequent antibiotic rounds don't affect it and it survives another day but the immune system surveillance also doesn't affect it because it doesn't even look like a bacteria anymore because normally we recognize the bacteria through the cell wall. Mm -hmm. It's like your, you know, your face, you know, your out, outward look, so it hides. Oh, it's like uh, Harry Potter's cloak of invisibility. Yes, I guess so. <laughs> it's hiding in the body, it, yes. and it can't be recognized. can't be recognized So then anymore. what kind of damage does it create? It creates autoimmune disease. And again, this is known in Merck's manual where a round of pen penicillin or other antibiotics can cause immediate signs of lupus and other autoimmune diseases. So it's not unusual to say that, but we're finding more and more that this whole array of over a hundred autoimmune diseases nowadays, where in the early 1900s there was like three or four named autoimmune diseases is secondary not only to all the toxins toxins in the bad food but a lot to the damage from the antibiotics so let me stop you right there i'm thinking about um children with ear infections let's say a lot of infants and toddlers have chronic ear infections and so we give them a course of antibiotics and hey this one has cherry flavoring you know and so you're just okay i'm helping my child these may lead to some of these problems, right? Absolutely. You're trading a ear infection for later, I don't know, depression in college or, you know, fatigue or low back pain or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like so many young people have autoimmune disorders. Yes. Can you name some of them? Like younger some? and younger. Rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes. Yes. People in their 20s with arthritis, and you're like, why do you have this? You're I know. 20. I know. <laughs> oh, it's getting younger and younger. It's just horrible. And it's, it's definitely, the thing is, is that, you know, allopathic medicine drugs are great in emergencies, but we should save them for that. So, you know, as a mother, so many mothers have their homeopathic test kit, or they have their echinacea, their golden seal, or whatever. 
whatever at home and a stitch in time if you hurry and address the issue you know like the ear infection you can give them uh, natural herbs you can do warm olive oil you can do all kinds of you know natural treatments stop them on the dairy which is usually the problem the dairy allergy with these upper respiratory tract infections and you can you know clear up an infection right away which is not a bad idea to have an infection because you're exercising the immune system it's just when they hang on or you truncate the process with an antibiotic or a drug you're actually stopping the knowledge and education of the immune system and then it doesn't know how to handle the next problem and then the next problem it gets larger and larger so I interrupted you please list more of the um, autoimmune disorders that are cropping up Okay, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, sarcoidosis, uh, lupus, Lyme's disease. Lyme's disease is very, you know, popular diagnosis right now. It's an opportunistic infection. It also is um, the uh, Borrelia is a, often a cell wall deficient bacteria, and it is an autoimmune disease nowadays. And a lot of people are getting that diagnosis. And it's an important one to diagnose, but again, we want to go back to our understanding of what the true meaning of diagnosis is. Why did you get, you know, why did you get positive it, IgenX, um, you know, titers? You know, wh- why did you, why were, was your body susceptible to these bacteria? I think what happens as parents is we kind of panic, oh, my child has this, let's do antibiotics, oh, it didn't work, let's do it again. You know, we're just thinking... Right. All guns blazing, but you're saying if we are more careful and try to find uh, treatments that work with the body rather than kind of suppressing you know, one thing leading to the next, right? Is, am I getting that right? Yes, and, and, you know, every mother, which a lot of mothers have, can order a small um, test kit from Hahnemann Pharmacy in San Rafael or Helios Pharmacy in London, and this tells you exactly what to give. High fever, give belladonna, you know, sprains and strains, give arnica, uh, nerve inflammation, give hypericum, ear infections, give chamomile, you know, so, you know, you can try these. It doesn't hurt if you miss the wrong remedy. These are acute little 30C remedies. They're not too strong, but often they can just turn that illness around and, and then you don't have to go to the more, you know, dangerous uh, medicines. Well, so this is just fascinating. It sounds like what you're really saying, if I have a problem in my body, First of all, I need to pay attention myself, right, Uh, before even seeing someone. But know that just because my knee hurts, it may not be connected to a tweak that I did when I was walking so much as maybe a problem actually in my mouth. Is that right? Right. And, you know, you certainly don't want to go on a whole round of chronic aspirin or anti-inflammatories or whatever for the knee because usually there's a deeper reason for the knee unless there's a traumatic accident. But even then, I want to say somebody has a traumatic accident unless it was really major. These these injuries should heal faster. I often have patients come in and say, you know, I had this accident 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, nah, it's really not logical unless it was extremely severe tendons, ligaments, joints, they really do heal over time. So usually it's something that is chronically disturbing the knee. Like if it's the right knee, it could be the liver, gallbladder dysfunction. You know, organs can certainly cause ipsilateral one-sided symptoms. It can be an issue there. It can be a right-sided dental focus. It can be a right-sided tonsil focus or sinus focus. So you want to look at your history. You know, you want to look at your childhood history. Did you have a a lot of ear infections, tonsillitis, you know, uh, bronchitis, etc. Did you have a lot of dental problems? Did you take a lot of antibiotics? You know, therefore, kind of getting that disease even more entrenched in your system. That disease process, short-term help, long-term problems. So, um, and the other thing I just want to emphasize again is that these focal infections are often silent. Uh, I can even include a scar, an appendix scar, for example. Usually scars don't bother you at all, but those are what the Germans call scar interference fields. They can be chronically disturbing, either the intestines below, the hip nearby, the low back. <clears throat> they can even cause headaches far away from the site. So in a lot of these scar interference fields or focal infections are silent and insidious. 
you rarely feel any symptoms from them. But the disturbed area called the disturbed feel, not local, somewhere else in the body, is chronically causing a problem. And that's why they're so hard to diagnose. I would guess so. If they're silent and you're asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. But you got your right knee. So when you have a right knee problem or a left hip or whatever, or a, you know, sore neck all the time, that's often not the cause. It's usually deeper than that. Well, what an interesting conversation. So if folks have questions, they can visit your website. What is it again? Uh, RadicalMedicine.com. I've got some e-books right on the home page and, and 10 bucks. You can download them. And then I've also got my more comprehensive book, uh, Radical Medicine, that you can order through Amazon. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Louisa. <laughs> thank you, Hilda. I really enjoyed it. My guest today was Louisa Williams. Go to her website, RadicalMedicine.com, for the ebooks and resources she was just describing. Or just go to WestonAPrice.org, click on the podcast page, go to episode 39 for the show notes. You'll even find the links to the homeopathy pharmacies that she was recommending. Have you been enjoying these podcasts? Have you benefited from them or from the resources on the website or local chapter meetings? If so, please become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. It's only $25 for students and seniors and $40 for a general membership. Your contribution is critical for the continued work of the foundation. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming and the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.